make you open our eyes. Who can understand the scriptures that the Holy Spirit of God himself has written? But Lord, we're praying that the Holy Spirit that wrote the scriptures will not only open our eyes to the scriptures, but will, uh, will shine his transforming light on the world. That the word inside us will become part of us and will transform us in Jesus' name. Glory be to your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, as we look at the uh, study before, we're going to take some studies starting today from the book of Micah. Um, and I would like to start by making us think about, you know, the impact of an inconspicuous but insignificant ministry. Um, a lot of preachers today love to be in the city. And you just even discover with some preachers, even when they start in the rural areas, in the town, the villages, and uh, what you call the countryside, as the ministry begins to expand, where do they want to go? They want to go and establish the headquarters in the city because that's where they will get recognition. And the high and mighty, the politicians, the rulers, and the rich people will be able to take note of them. The, the TV stations and you know, the radio stations will begin to uh, take note and maybe begin to run some articles on them. And of course, that will lead to even more growth. Publicity will lead to more growth. But there's something about rural preachers, you know, village preachers, small town preachers, countryside preachers, uh, that they're able to, they might not be the best of orators, but they're able to say as it is. And they're able to just be very direct and very frank. And that's what you are going to see in the book of Micah. Uh, today, we'll try as much as the Lord leads us to cover uh, from chapters one to chapter three. Now, I'm going to start with a quiz here. And for this, um, we will have people that will raise their hand and come up with. Now, without looking at your Bible, I would like you to quote any verse that you know from the book of Micah. Without opening, just the one you already know, not by looking in your Bible. Or, or So if there are any hands raised, bro, uh, Kyle, dear, bro, Moses, you can. We just need about three people. Just say the, say the first one that comes to your mind from the book of Micah. Even if you don't know the passage and verse, you can do it. Sister Tina has raised her hand. So let's move to Sister Tina. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The voice that comes to my heart is where it says, truly, I am full of power. Praise the Lord. That is a wonderful one. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Let's, yeah. Well, I need about two or three. Now, Micah is in the Bible. So you, since you've been reading your Bible, brothers and sisters, what, give me one verse in Micah. If I say Ephesians now, or maybe if I said Isaiah or Genesis, I'm sure we'll have a lot of hands up. And, okay, I'll give one more, two more seconds. Anyone? Unto the Lord I have sinned, and to, unto him I will plead. God bless you. So you can see not, not a lot of verses in Micah in our, in our, in our memory, are they? And Micah is a significant book. It, it's called one of the minor prophets. But you see, the minor, the minor prophets that we have in the Bible, they're not uh, people, prophets like, you know, Nahum and Micah and Joel. They're not minor because they're not as important as the major prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel or Ezekiel. But they're called minor because their books are kind of small compared to Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Micah has seven chapters. So... But because they're so small in our Bible, sometimes when we're flipping, we flip right through it. And the challenge is that many of us might not have read the book of Micah through. And that's one of the reasons why we're taking this. We might know one or two verses or maybe three or four verses from there. And I'm going to show the common verses that we might know. But apart from that, how many people have read Micah? And when we start reading, we get to chapter one. And we see the names of strange places, and we kind of maybe skip it and go to somewhere where we can, where we feel you know it's easier to understand. So these these are what I think are the common verses that people might know. You might have heard these in messages, uh, like Sister Tina quoted um, Micah chapter three verse eight: "For truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might." to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. 
And then we have uh, this wonderful verse in uh, chapter 5, which is talking about Jesus Christ. Oh, thou Bethlehem, a, 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 a flatter. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been of old from everlasting. Praise the Lord. And then he has showed the old man what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, with thy God. And uh, the last one is uh, Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and that passeth by the transgression of the rem remnant of thy heritage, for retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighted in mercy? Now the problem is, in between these verses, we might not know what's going on. And you might have, you will, should have heard of this saying, you know, a text without a context is a pretext. Anytime we pick texts out, we just pick one verse out, I say, oh, I like that. That's a promise. I like that promise. I'm going to mark it in my Bible. I'm going to pick it out. I'm going to, you know, quote it in my preaching. Without the context in between, it's a pretext. It's just being, it's not real. It's being forced into the interpretation we give it. Now, if I ask us to give me an interpretation of these verses in the context of the book, we might struggle. We might struggle. If I say, well, we've no, we know about this uh, Micah chapter 3 verse 8, but what is the context? Why is Micah saying this? Who is he saying it to? What does it actually mean in his context? We might struggle a bit. But by the grace of God, through this week and the next uh, few weeks, we'll be able to get a good understanding of who this man Micah is and what his ministry was like and why it's important for us to, to study him. So these are the key things we need to address. Who was Micah and what was his message? And why should I care? You know, he lived years and years ago, centuries ago. So why should I care about what he said to the people he said it to? Why should I care about the context of his message? Why can't I just pick those four verses and then use them because they're wonderful? Why do I need to know the whole background? And how does it affect me today? Now, as you look at Micah, I'll pick verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, and the word of the Lord came to Micah, sorry, the word of that came to Micah, the Morris fight, in the days of Jotham, Hezekiah, kings and uh, Jotham, Ahab, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, we have a name. We have a hometown. We have a time, and we have some places there. So we have a name. The name is Micah. Micah means "Who is like God." It's, you know, a short form of Micaiah, or you might even say Michael. Who is like God? What a wonderful name! Is there anyone who? It's a it's a rhetorical question. Who? is there in heaven and in earth that is like God. And the challenge that we see here, as you see in other people like Ezekiel, who we studied a few weeks ago, uh, is that he actually reflected that name. His life reflects that name. You see it in what he's going to say. Is there anyone who is there, who is like God? The challenge is that our, do our names reflect our personality? Do they, uh, do, they, uh, do they reflect our ambitions? Do they uh, reflect our you know, daily lifestyle? That's the challenge we get. We might have wonderful names like Michael. We might have names like Esther. You know, we might have wonderful Bible names, but do they really reflect our character? Secondly, we see Moreseth. And Moreseth, as we're going to see, is a very... You might look at many maps of Israel and might not see Moreseth there. You might not see Moreseth there. So that's why I put Gath. So Moreseth near Gath. It's like, if I, when sometimes when I tell people, I say, I live in Northolt. You see the look on their face. They say, well, their face is North, Northolt. And I say, well, um, do you know Hifro? And they say, yeah. I say, yeah, near Hifro. It's not that it's near, you know, I can't walk from my house to Hifro, but, well, Hifro is where they know. So, if, if uh, Micah is going to describe his hometown, 
and you, you get people have that blank look on their face. Where on earth is Morris? Even though I live in Israel, I don't know where Morris is because it's one of those back villages. You would say, well, Morris near Gath. And he prophesied in the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Three kings, the same message. He never changed that message. You know, good king, uh, you know, partially good king, bad king, and then good king. Never changed the message. And he preached to Samaria, which is up north, and preached to uh, Jerusalem, which is down south. Now, there's something that is missing here. Now, one thing that is glaringly missing is that there is no information about himself in that book, apart from his town, there is no other information about himself. Now, the reason why he had to put his town actually is because there are many Micahs in Israel, so you need to know which of the Micahs. So it's the Micah from Moraseth, or, or Morasteth. The, the Mar, uh, Morasteth, yeah, that's, that's it. Ma Micah from Morasteth is the one that is given this uh, prophecy. So, um, but apart from that, doesn't tell us who his father is, doesn't tell us his family name, doesn't tell us, um, you know, anything about himself. Does he, is he married? Is he single? What is his profession? You know, he, it's all about the message. It, it only focuses on the message. And that is, that is something that we need to imbibe. In our preaching, it's less about us and more about the message. Because particularly if talking about ourselves is going to distract from the message. So this is a minister who is lost in Christ and who is saying, uh, less of me and more of Christ. I must decrease and he must increase. Now, you can contrast Micah chapter 1 or compare and contrast with some other uh, people. And I picked these people, as I'm going to show later, deliberately. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah is a contemporary of um, Micah. They are they ministered around about the same time. But this is how Isaiah introduces himself, the vision of Isaiah, which is the same as the word of the Lord that came to Isaiah. The son of Amos, there's a, 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 there's a parent there, uh, which is so concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So you still see there's a, there's a place, there's a time period. And Hosea, Hosea was another contemporary from the Northern Kingdom. You still see a parent's name and you see a, um, you see a time period and you see, you know, a, you could, you could, you, so you, you could kind of pin it down to where, but instead of giving a parent's name, uh, Micah is just given his uh, hometown there. Now let's read uh, John chapter three. So the book of John, let's open our Bibles to John chapter three and verse 30. So how does all this apply to us today? This is John the Baptist talking in the New Testament. John chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He's talking about himself and Christ. Less of me, I must decrease, and you must hear less and less about me, for he must increase. I must decrease. It's almost like there's, actually, there is um, an index. There's a, what you call the Jesus index in anything, in any activity, and in any message, in any, thing we do for the Lord, you ask yourself, what is the Jesus index of it? How much of Jesus is in this thing over how much of me is in this thing? Um, you know, as, a, as preachers, you know, there could be a lot of you, you know, about you, your testimony, things that have happened to you and the wonders that you've done and how God has used you and how rich you are, how God is blessing you and so on and so forth. And you know how indispensable you are, and you know how lucky the church is to have you, and uh, you know just a little bit of Jesus. You know, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of Jesus in the beginning, and there's a little bit of Jesus in the end of the message, and in between is a lot of stories, and that should not be. So, he said, it says he must decrease, he must increase, and I must decrease. And then let's also read Galatians chapter six, from verse fourteen. Galatians chapter 6 from verse 14. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid, God forbid, this is Paul in the strongest possible term, God forbid, let it never happen in the days of my life. God forbid that I should glory, that I should glory, that I should boast. 
save unless in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. God forbid that I should glory. Let it never happen that I should glory except by the cross of Jesus Christ that made me who I am today. So three prophets, as we see, and then we're going to go into some geography now to fully understand, you know, the Bible. We need to understand our geography very well. Um, so there are four, actually four prophets that were kind of the eighth century prophets, eighth century, that means 800 years before Christ, the minister. Um, and one I've left out, I will tell you his name later. I left him out because he ministered in the days of Uzziah, which is before uh, Micah's ministry. Um, Micah ministry ministered in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and uh, Hezekiah. Isaiah, as you see in the previous slide, started before that. He started in the days of Uzziah. Um, Hosea also, as you see, in the slide before that, ministered in the days of those three kings, Joham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And there's one more, who is Amos. He ministered in the days of Uzziah. Now, this is where, uh, this is where uh, Moreseth is kind of located. Actually, if you read Micah, let's go to Micah again. And you say, well, so it's not as if I'm making up a geography here. In Micah chapter 1, verse 14, where is Moreseth? As a, you can't see on the map, it's so small it doesn't show up on the map. But in uh, Micah chapter 1, verse 14, you see, Therefore shalt thou give presents to Moreseth Gath. Moreseth Gath. It's like when you see in the Bible, when it says Moreseth Gath, it means Moreseth near Gath or Moreseth in Gath. So it's like Norfolk in London. <laughs> so Moreseth in Gath. Gath. Um, and it's just like Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem, if you say Bethlehem, it's so small that people might not know where it is. But you have to say Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem in Judah. So that's that's what we see here. Um, so as you look at the geography, he is down here. He's ministering down here. Isaiah is ministering right in the capital, right near the palace, going in and out of the palace here. Hosea is somewhere up north in Israel. I know all the time. So four prophets, um, the, same, yes, the same message, the same, uh, boils down to the same message to the people. And uh, the lesson we learned from here is that, you know, we're not alone. We're just part of a puzzle. I'm doing my bit, you're doing your bit. I've got no need, need to envy the person that is ministering, you know, in one other place. We're all... We're all doing the same thing. Someone is ministering in Oxford, Bambra, another person in Guildford, another person in Slough, another person in Reading, you know, another person in London. You know, another person might be ministering up north, another person might be ministering in America, and you might see them on the TV and they're having a fantastic, you know, breakthrough, a fantastic ministry. And another person might be in a village in an interior part of, you know, Asia or Africa. And we're all doing our bits. We're all messengers of God, you know, declaring our message in the place where God has planted us. The person in that village, you know, without electricity, without good water, without, you know, flushing toilets in Africa, shouldn't envy, you know, the person that is ministering from London because, oh, look at them. I'm seeing them on YouTube. I'm not on YouTube. Can you see their service today? Can you see how they all look so nice in their suits? And look, me and with these farmers back here, and you know, as we're in the church building, you know, we're using a school, and the, the it's an uncompleted building, and you know, the leak, the roof is leaking upon us, and the floor is not tiled. You know, the floor is a dust floor. We have a dust carpet on our feet. I was having the service because the building is incomplete, and you know, the the, the window, the, there are no windows and doors. We even have goats running through our service. You know, and dogs coming into the service, stray dogs, because, you know, there's no door. And I'm laboring, I'm faithful, and I'm doing all I can. And God, why are you blessing me? Like, why can't you transport me? And I know I have the word. Let me go and preach it all to all these fancy people in, you know, New York, or these fancy people in, uh, in Manchester or in London. No, 
Micah is back here in the back wash, the back country here, just near Gath. And Isaiah is here, you know, very popular prophet in the land. And Hosea is up here. And that's what we need to learn. You know, if you're there, you're saying, well, look at where I am today. How I wish. Maybe you see promotion as them moving you from one place to another. You know, some people are like that. They're in the village and they're saying, they see that if they move them from the district, the village district, into the headquarter at the region, that's a promotion. They say, I've been promoted now. Everybody, I'm sharing a testimony. I've been promoted because I used to be in that village church of 20 people and now they've moved me into the city. They, promise, they see it as a promotion. And then they send them on missions. They send them from you know, that country. They send them abroad. They say, go to you know, the Caribbean or go to you know, South America or go to even North America. And they say, well, I'm promoted. That's not the way to view ministry. We're all in the corners where God has put us. And not one is significant, more significant than the other. I pray that the Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. So, God's instruments examined. Now, as you contrast this with, um, or you compare this with Micah, Micah ministered in small towns and villages, not like, um, not like um, Isaiah, but he ministered in smaller towns and villages, in rural towns and villages. There's no mention of any family at all. So once again, we can begin to see we're not all the same. Some of us are called to serve God. We're workers, we're Christians, we're called to serve God. I know in you know, cities, we're called to serve God with, in places that have a lot of amenities. Some of us, we have favor on our ministry and you know, even the kings, you know, are, they, they come into our congregation or when they have trouble, they could ask us, you know, questions. you have ministers and uh, general, you know, founders of ministries that have so much uh, favor with the government, that the government see them as advisors on spiritual things. And you have others that are just, you know, in, in, in not recognized. They're, they're just, um, you know, they're maybe in a quiet kind of place. And some might even be persecuted. So there's no cause to compare Isaiah with Micah and say, well, one is better than the other. I would like to have the ministry of Isaiah, or I would like to have the ministry of Micah. Life is a package. Isaiah, uh, this man, uh, Micah might have died naturally. Uh, traditions tell us that this man, even after about 64 years of ministry, a king came up and was so terrible that, you know, he, so he, he caught him in sunder. Uh, the tradition even goes as far as saying that he was put inside the trunk of a tree and was sown in sunder by K King Manasseh. So one is not better than the other. It's all, it's all um, service in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord will give us the grace to be, to be faithful and contented where we are. Um, he had a long ministry, three, he was, he covered three kings, but he had a long ministry, but not as long as the ministry of Isaiah. The key lesson is, are you called to minister in a lowly place? Do you consider your condition to be more dire than your fellow workers in God's vineyard? Are we called to minister in a lowly place? Say, for instance, if we called you and we say, our brother, we want you to go out to help us you know, establish a fellowship, maybe a house fellowship or a campus fellowship somewhere. It's outside of your, your main town or city. We have, maybe we have one or two people over there, or maybe we have no people. Just go every weekend and go and do evangelism there and see what we can start there. Are you the type of person that will force ask pastor, before I say yes or no, could you tell me where it is? Can you tell me where it is? Uh, could you tell me how I'll be taken care of? There is there any hotel I'll be staying overnight there? You know, what are the arrangements for me there? Are you the type of person that is like that? Or, you know, are you happy to minister in a lowly place? Do you consider your condition to be more dire? There's no reason for that. You, you can't do that. To, con to look at your own conditions. Well, I'm serving the Lord, but he is married. I'm not married. Maybe. Maybe I'm not married. 
he has children, maybe I don't have children. You know, he has, you know, access to people about, they know all about him and, you know, he's, he's popular. I am doing the same work as he's doing, but nobody knows me, I'm not popular. Therefore, I begin to slow down because I'm not recognized. Never allow any room in your heart for comparison, for envy, for inferiority complex, or for any form of self-pity. Now, we're moving on to point number two. Point number one that we've just been looking at is God's instruments examined. We've been looking at instruments one against another and applying it to ourselves. Now we're going to dive deep into uh, Micah's, um, Micah's um, message here in chapter one. Now, I'm going to take us back to from verse 10 to verse 16. From verse 10 to verse 16, you see a number of towns, and these are small towns around where Micah was living. And he's, he's giving them the message of the Lord to them. And we're going to see later in point three, why God was grieved, and why God was giving the, them the message of judgment that was coming upon them. But as you look at these towns, the names of, as you read it, you might get stuck, and maybe this is where you bounce off reading Micah, because you look at all these strange towns and you don't really understand what they mean. Now from verse 10, it said, declare ye not at God, weep ye not at all in the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the, in the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sapphire, leaving thy shame naked. The inhabitant of Zenam, come not forth in the morning of Beth Ezel. He shall, not, he shall receive of you his standing. The inhabitant of Morath waited carefully for good, but evil came from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Now you see in the Bible, there is a lot that is hidden. God has hidden many things, for just as gold is hidden and diamonds are hidden and precious stones are hidden, you, you rarely find all these precious minerals, all these precious material just lying on the ground for any Tom, Dick and Harry to just pick up. They're buried deep inside rock and deep inside the ground for those people that are diligent enough to you know, dig them out. Otherwise, everyone, even people that don't know their value, will just be picking them off the surface of the ground. Even oil, which is like black gold, is hidden down deep down in the ground. And people, you have to labor to, to get down to it. And it's the same thing with the word of God. God has made, written his word in such a way that people that you know, if you just, if you are just very casual with it, you will still get something. You know, you can still be born again. You know, because it's it's real. It's just easy. If even if you're a child, if you have faith like a child, you can be born again. You can, you know, be converted. But to get the real meat and the real gems and the real diamonds in the Word of God, I will take you deeper. You have to do some study. So when you just read this on the surface, you say all these towns. You know, it's as good as describing some towns in, you know, somewhere I've never been to in, in this world. And this is somewhere I've never been to, and it's also somewhere that is uh, centuries away. So why, why should I bother with all this? But you see, in, hidden in these names of the town is the message. The message is hidden in the names of the town. Now, Micah is striking a, a, a stroke of genius here, absolute genius, because he, He's taking the names of the town and he's putting the message with the name of the town. He's saying the town, he's using the name of the town and he's turning that name of the town and he's alliterating with the message that he's given. And let me try and decode it for us here. Now, what he's actually saying is tell it not at tell town, that's Gat. Gat is a tell town, tell it not in that tell town, that town where, you know, stories are told. And you see that word which says, weep not at all. Actually, that at all, that is in the King James Version, in some other translations, is translated echo, which means weep down. So he's saying, tell it not in tell town. Weep not ye not at weep town. That's the name of, he's taking, taking the name of the town and he's turning it into the message. He says, roll thyself in the dust in the house of dust. If you check up in your Bible, if you have a rule of checking up, you'll find that, that word Afra means house of dust. So roll not in the dust 
at the house of dust and pass away that inhabitant of beauty place sapphire is means beauty so it says pass away that inhabitant of beauty place in nakedness and shame you don't have any more beauty by the time god has put his judgment you have no more beauty the, the place that the, the village that is called beauty has no more beauty anymore and then it says the inhabitants of march town zana will march marches not forth that's zana it means march town Morning of thy neighbor of the neighbor town beth ezel means neighborly or neighbor town the morning of neighbor town will take away any neighborly support that means that the problem will be so much that they will not even be neighborly anymore. So the town that is called neighborly or friendly will no longer be neighborly anymore because of the suffering that they're going to get. For the inhabitant of Marot, which is bitter town, they waited for good, but evil came from the Lord. All the inhabitant of the invincible town, that's Lachish or horse town, bind the chariot to the swift pace. And the houses of light town, the Asip is the light town, shall be a lie unto the kings of Israel. Now, that is, so the people that were in these towns, they really understood what he was saying. Now, but for us today, I hope that this actually helps us a little bit. But let me even go further. Let me go further. So let me pick from uh, what a, one of the Bible scholars has said. If Michael were preaching in London, he will say something like this. Hackney will be hacked to pieces. Hammersmith will be hammered flat. Battersea will be battered for all to see. And Shoreditch will be thrown in a ditch near the shore. Crouch end will, be cr will crouch with fear at the end and there'll be no healing for healing. Harrow will find itself under a harrow and church end will see the end of the church. Backing will be set on by wild dogs and sheep will graze over what is left of shepherd's bush. Vultures will feed on the corpses at Peckham. Now, why is he writing in this style? He's writing in this style because he wants the message to get home to the people, to people to be sure. And it's, it's for us today as communicators of the gospel as well. It's not just the message you have, but you need to craft that message in a way that the message will be able to come home and the people will be able to understand it. This is a stroke of brilliance in terms of the prophet's communication. Now, we we'll move on to the last point before we pray. And God's grievance explains why is God saying judgment is coming? Now, let's look at Micah chapter 2. In Micah chapter 2, Let's see what they were doing. Woe unto them that devise iniquity and walk evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hands. And they convert fields and take, away, and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, thus said the Lord, behold, I am against, the fa against his family why devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go hastily, for this time is evil. So as already you can begin to see what's going on here. You can begin to see the oppression that is going on here. People in the night not sleeping, as they're on their beds, they're thinking, what evil are they going to do in the morning? What injustice are they going to do in the morning? Whose land can they rob in the morning? Which widow can they evict from their houses in the morning? Who can they repossess their houses in the morning? How can they become richer at the expense of other people in the morning? How can they take you know, the fields of the fatherless by violence because of big grammar and because you know, they, they have the legal power? How can they do that when, when they wake up? Let's skip to verse... Um, Let's skip to verse nine. The people, the women of my people, have you cast out from their pleasant houses? When the husband is dead, they find a way, they come and say, well, maybe the husband was borrowing money from us. They cast widows out. They cast women out of their homes that they are built up. From their children, you have taken away my glory forever. 
So this, there are three main grievances. As you read the prophets, as, as you read the uh, prophets like uh, Micah, as you read Amos, as you read Hosea, as you read Jeremiah, as you read Ezekiel, as you read many, all the prophets, what you begin to see is that all grievances against his people that made him punish them and send them into captivity fall under three main headings. You have the idolatry, then worshiping other gods. You have the injustice, uh, 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 injustice man to man in the society, the cruelty between each other and the violence in between the, themselves and also immorality. Now Micah in particular focuses on, it focuses on the last, it focuses mainly on you know, the injustice and the low moral standards, even though the other two were there, but he focuses mostly on the injustice that is in the society because he's seen it in the rural areas. He's seen that from the city, you know, it's flowing this, you know, stem of injustice and unbelief, and he spoke about it. Um, uh, let's go to chapter three. In chapter three, from verse one to verse four, here I said, and I said, here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil? Who pluck off the, their skin from, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from their bones? Who eats the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot? And as flesh, as flesh within the cauldron. The picture that he's painting here, he's not just saying you people are unjust, you are unjust towards each other. He paints a picture that grabs their attention. Can you see, this is a shocking picture. He is painting a picture of them eating the poor. Can you see, you know, ripping the skin of the poor from off them and then putting the, 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 the meat inside a pot and boiling it. And that is how it was in the sight of God. The injustice that they were doing towards each other, that's how I say, well, they might say, well, but we, we didn't kill anybody, you know, we, didn't, we didn't cook anybody, but that's how God was picturing it, that you are eating up the poor, you know, just for your own enjoyment. And in chapter, in, in verse, from verse nine to verse 12, here I hear this, I pray you, all heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that are poor judgment and pervert all equity. They build upon Zion with blood and Jerusalem with equity. So we can see it's not just, it's not just the people in his local, he was speaking also to the source of the problem, which is Jerusalem. He was, his prophecy extended up to them. The heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire. The prophets divine for money, Yet will they lead on the Lord and say, is, it not, is not the Lord among us? No, no evil shall befall us. That is utter deception. There are people like that today who will say, we do all these things. You know, we call, when we come to church and we sing and we dance, and God is among us. And God is saying, I am concerned about the injustice that is between you. About the low moral standards. In chapter 2, verse 11, you will see it in chapter 3, from verse 5 to verse 8. He's saying things like, if anybody can be a prophet among you, if somebody is drunk and stand up and say, God is speaking to me, he can be your preacher because you have no moral standard. The key thing in this book, we're going to see later in another study is this, in chapter six, verse eight. He has shown the old man what is good and what does the law require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. He doesn't expect much from us. It's not by sacrifice. It's not by, you know, give him money or whatever. He's just saying, all what God is expecting from you is to do justly to your brother and your sister and your fellow human being in society and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God doesn't expect much of us, my brethren. And that's one of the key things we're going to see in the book of Micah. That's very easy to pacify God and to please him. He doesn't expect much from us. We can take note of the following verses as we move on. Now let's go back to our quiz. So in a, a one or two, I'm going to ask us to unmute ourselves now. So I want you to see, 
Can you quote any verse? Somebody who, has, who didn't speak at the beginning. Can you quote any verse now from the book of Micah without opening your Bible? Or can you tell us the context? Let me say. Hi. Can you tell us the context of these two verses? Um, um, Micah chapter 7. Rejoice not over me, my enemy. I can't remember the verse. I say, Rejoice not over me, my enemies. For when I fall, the Lord will give me up. When I sit in darkness, no will be a light unto me. Amen. God bless you, my sister. That is, that is Micah. Say, so don't. And later on in, in our thought study, we're going to see the context of that verse. Why he's saying, rejoice over me, my enemy. The people don't just say things in the Bible. There's a reason, there's a context why they're saying it. And for us to be able to understand it properly, we need to understand the context. Yes, yeah, so for instance, the context of chapter 3, verse 8, as you look at chapter 3, verse 8, you know, you begin to see, look at from verse 5. It says, Thus said the Lord concerning the prophets that do err, that bite with their teeth, and cry peace, and he that put it, and he put it not in their mouths. The evil prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you, and ye shall have not a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, and ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophet, and the night shall be dark over them. There, then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. But look at verse 8. For truly I am full of power by the Spirit of God, of the Lord, and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So he's, still, he's not just saying I'm full of power. He's saying, look, this is what God is saying. This is what is going to happen to all those prophets that are just prophesying of their own. But he says, for the true prophet of God, he says, I am full of power. They are going to become weak. I'm going to become strong. They are going to be in darkness. I'm going to have the light of the Lord shining upon me. God is going to put a distinction be between his prophet. Now, we summarize by some key lessons to take away. Now, Micah is showing us something here. So Micah is showing us, is showing us that true relationship with God is, is separably, inseparably linked with how we treat one another. You can't say, I'm so spiritual, and you are mistreating, you are maltreating the supporting the lonely ones in your life. Now, every one of us has lonely ones in our life. How do you treat them? How do you exploit the power that you have over them? How do you exploit those that you have power over? So this could be your employees, if you are an employer, your subordinates, your junior co-workers, your tenants, your wife or your children, your mates, your poorer relatives back home, how do you treat them? How do you treat them like that? Do you treat them like they have, what can they do? So this is the lesson that God has given to us. Our relationship with God, how spiritual you are will be reflected. And the question you need to ask yourself in the society, if there were no repercussions for ill treatment, if people could treat their co-workers anyhow and not be sacked or not be called to tribunal, how would they do it? In the society, if the law enforcement could treat people anyhow and get away with it, how would they treat people? And that's why in some countries that we came from, they treat people horribly because they know that they can get away with it. The politicians, they know that they can get away with it. And that's why you begin to see the evil in mankind when there's no repercussion for evil doing. Now, how do you treat the less fortunate in society? Do you care if they, if they are suffering at the hand of others? So you might say, well, I am not maltreating anybody, but when people are being maltreated in the society, the strangers, you, you, you see, you, you're walking by, you see them, the illegal immigrants and the person that is being discriminated because of their race or of their religion. They might not be your religion, they might be another religion, but the whole fact that they're being discriminated against is not fair. And the poor in the society, are you, do you even care? Now, some other lessons to take away. Most ministers, most preachers, they love to minister to the high and mighty, to the kings, to the rulers, to the politicians, to wealthy people. But as, as, as Micah, are you called to minister in a lowly place? Do you consider your condition to be dire, to be more dire than your fellow workers in God's vineyard? Never allow any room in your heart for comparison, envy, 
if you wrote to complex or self-pity. And you can read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and verse 6, which will, which will shine light on that. So there's no room for comparison. He or oh, his ministry in that place, and you can see those people are very receptive. You know, that side of London or that side of the country, they have a big church because you know, there's a lot more of our community over there, but we are ministering in this place. There's a lot more of other communities here, and that's why we're not, and there's no room for comparison. You might have a big ministry like Isaiah, or you might have another one like uh, uh, Micah. Never use the status of your media audience to judge the reach of your administration. Although Micah's immediate audience were rural folk, his impact went very far. And I'm going, I must show you this before we pray. Now, in Jeremiah chapter, because, because it's a minor prophet and his book is very, very small, you might say, well, he didn't achieve much. No, that's, that's not true. In Je the book of Jeremiah, chapter 26, let's open our Bibles here, please. Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse 18. You must read this. Because Jeremiah lived about 100 years after Micah. So Jeremiah was not alive when Micah was ministering. Micah had died. But Jeremiah is going to mention Micah. Now it's very rare for prophets to mention each other. As you read through all the prophets, it's rare for a prophet to mention the name of another prophet. That's not how they operate. God speaks to them directly. They don't refer back most of the time. But in Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 18, Micah the Morasite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake unto all the people of Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house of the, the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. The Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and did all Judah put, put him at all to death. Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord? And the Lord repented of the evil that he had pronounced against them. Thus might we procure great evil against us. So the people were talking. I said, look, don't persecute Jeremiah. Don't kill him. Because remember Micah in his own time, this is what he said to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was not angry. Hezekiah did not put him to death. But the reach of, um, the reach of uh, Micah goes further. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he's saying, O that Bethlehem, you, even though you are the smallest of the people of the tribes, out of you shall come he that will be ruler. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 2, read, write down verse 1 to verse 6. I'm not going to read everything. But what, what the story is this, that when the wise men came from the east, when Jesus was born, the wise men came, and they went straight to Herod's palace because they thought that the, a king is born and he must be in the palace. And when he got there, Herod was disturbed because he was a king as well. And then he called the scribe, he called the people that knew the Bible. And he said, can you tell me when the king is going to be born? All you priests, tell me. And guess where they're going to open the Bible? They had to open the book of Micah. And in verse uh, 5 and verse 6, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for as it is, for thus it is written by the prophet, O thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are thou not least among the prophets of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. That is the reach of Micah. So never think that, well, the people that are looking at their faces in the church, they are very few or they're very small or they're not rich or they're not, they're not people that have clout in the society. Be faithful to God. Only God knows where you're going to reach. Your message can still get to the palace. Your message can still get to, for generations to come, kings might be reading about you. And even us today, we're still reading about Micah and his blessings. So I want us to take this to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow down our heads. I want you to come in. What, you have, what have you learned personally? What have you been able to glean from today? I've introduced you to a man whose name is, who is like God? Is there anyone like God? A man who will not talk about himself, who will not give his story, but who will give God's story and says, oh, I'm just a mouthpiece. All you need to know is my name. All you need to know is where I came from, my, my, my town. 
You don't need to know anything more about me. Hear ye, hear ye. This is the message that I have for you. A man who will not envy his brother, his fellow worker, who has access to the kings, who the kings call on. The kings don't call on Micah. Micah ministers to the ruler folk. God planted Isaiah in Jerusalem, close to the palace. He can go in and out of the palace. He can talk to the kings anyhow. And God planted Micah even in the plains of Gath. And he says, still speak against the evil in, you see. Warn the people as the judgment is coming, it will not just take the people in Jerusalem away, it's also going to affect the people in the rural area who have degenerated in their moral standards. What are you going to take forward from today? Are you, do you, do you look at yourself as, when is God going to bless me and promote me out of this place? When is God going to promote me out of this situation? He is blessed with this. I'm not blessed with this. He is serving God because he's married. I'm not married, so my, I can't have the same impact. He is serving God. He has children. I don't have children, so I can't have the same impact. He has, God is giving me, is speaking to me a lot. He has 66 chapters in his book. I only have seven chapters in my book. Therefore, I'm discouraged. No, it shouldn't be so. How do you care about the downtrodden in your society, the ones in your neighborhood? Do you care at all about what the poor are going through? In this situation, we find ourselves in this country. The people that are out of work, the people that are out of home, do you care? In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, I really want to bless you because of the gems, the diamonds, and the rubies, and the gold that you have planted for us, and the oil that you have planted for us, that you've kept for us, hidden in the book of Micah. And you say, those who will be diligent, those who will seek, will find it. Lord, as we begin to open the pages of the Bible, I will begin to say, Lord, teach us. Open our eyes that we will see. You will open our eyes. And these timers will not just leave them there. We'll take them home with us. We'll be like that man that found treasure buried in the field. I will go and sell all we have. I will buy the field. Glory be to your holy name, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. So I'll pass back over to the moderator.